Hello and welcome to P Guru's channel. I'm your host Sri Ayer. Today we have a very special guest, writer Sandeep Balakrishna. Sandeep is a technologist, author of Tipu Sultan, The Tyrant of Mysore, the English translator of S L Bhairappa's Avarna, and an independent scholar. He also runs his website called Dharma Dispatch. Dot in. I'm sure many of you have read his excellent work, and uh, we are going to talk a little bit about him and his work. and his passion and and he lives in bangalore and you will see his uh, backdrop it's a splendid uh, green uh, backdrop <laughs> that we have sandeep welcome to p guru's channel thank you shri thank you very much so uh, sandeep um i was blown away by one of your pieces that i read on uh, the maker of the movie shankara bharanam uh, hmm. kasi nathan viswanath Mm. now uh, like you i guess uh, i'm you know my mother tongue is tamil but i grew up in hyderabad i multiple okay. languages and mm. okay. to me you know sankara varnam was one of those very very quiet releases but i was traveling deep south in tirunelveli mm. which is like uh, 50 60 kilometers north of uh, kanyakumari yeah. and 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 i'm listening to this the tirunelveli is known for sweet it's called tirunelveli yes. halwa it's a very yeah, very yeah, yeah. Yeah. Very tasty, tasty, sweet. Yeah, so yeah. I'm, 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 yeah. I'm standing at the Tirunel Valley uh, Halwa stand, and we are waiting for okay. our order to be packed. And the guy mm. is saying, "Sir, listen to this mm. music, sir. It is so wonderful." The man could okay. not speak one word of Telugu, but he loved the music in Sankara Varam. That was mm -hmm. my first introduction to this music. And 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 mm. boy, what a movie that was! I mean, in a was, genre yeah. of you know, also mm. rants and you know, stale mm. copy mm. ripoffs of Hollywood and Bollywood and what have you, this movie mm. was a fresh of breath air, and it yeah. kind of showcased you know, um, uh, put the spotlight on something that we had in our own house, this great mm. treasure, but nobody mm. knew how to appreciate that, and he brought mm. that thing out. So mm. I loved your uh, characterization of his work. Vishwanath's mm -hmm. work, and and uh, boy, I mean, I, I I really really hope and wish that you could write for us. I mean, this mm -hmm. was a, a seven eight minute read, but it mm -hmm. it gives it takes somebody uh, down memory lane, even mm -hmm. without seeing any of Vishwanath's movies, you can get an idea of the director. By the way, I'll add yeah. a little bit more to your uh, your story that's not mm -hmm. there. In one of his interviews, uh, S T B has uh, said that Vishwanath would. get up in the morning and uh, he would write his own movies scripts yes, it was yeah. his story i watched you know? that yeah i watched oh, you watched that one yeah. okay i watched that a, one such an incredible mm. person and mm -hmm. and towards the end he stopped making movies because he said i just don't understand what the audience want anymore mm. And, mm. and and it's a real loss for the the people uh, of uh, of telugu and as well as you know I, it's not just telugu right he did sargam which was a big musical hit yeah, rishi kapoor and jayaprada mm -hmm. yeah he sargam is a hindi remake of his uh, uh, telugu movie siri siri muva yeah siri siri muva right yeah, that that predated uh, shankara bharan right 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 the right i mean other I, anecdote, yeah. yeah the other anecdote about shankara bharan is that it did not find any theaters yes uh, you know when it was ready for release so they found on obscure theater in some gully in hyderabad old city and uh, it's one of those classic tales of uh, what you call word of mouth uh, popularity and then it became a landmark of indian cinema so there is pre shankara varnam k vishwanath and there is shankara varnam post shankara varnam vishwanath uh, in a sense you can call him a pan indian film maker absolutely absolutely yeah. i mean and it was I, I, he followed it up with some fantastic movies like yeah, uh, yeah. sagar sangam uh, sagar sangamam and then swati mutyam also after that and swarna kamalam there was one other movie which yeah. talks about the jealousy of an established singer over an upcoming yeah. guy swati kiranam swati kiranam my yeah. god that one was he didn't do so well in the, in yeah he didn't do well actually in the yeah. box office yeah. but if yeah. you if you look at the music in that mm -hmm. uh, i'm not sure it was kavi mahadevan or somebody else it was mahadevan yeah it was, it was mahadevan, mahadevan right i mean if mahadevan. you remember there is one song on amrita varshini that it mm. it anathiniya yeah anathiniya right. anathiniya mm. vaani jayaram 
Yeah, yeah she and just killed it totally. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Viewers, you have to listen to some of this music. I know you yeah. think that music sounds good, but when you mm. listen to the third time, fourth time, fifth time, the mm. underneath layers start coming out. And that movie Absolutely. was a fantastic mm. movie because it, it shows the jealousies of an established singer and he sees mm -hmm. this child prodigy and he tries mm. his level best to keep that guy under his thumb. Yeah, to kill his uh, uh, you know, career by constantly choking his talent. Yes, yes, yes. And then what uh, not to do, I yeah. guess. <laughs> what not to do, yeah. Yes. So yeah. Le let's segue back to some of your work, Sandeep. What okay. prompted you to write the book on uh, Tipu Sultan? Because I'll give you one story, personal mm. story, but let's mm. first listen to your side and I'll give you what my connect to that is. Okay, uh, so nothing really, uh, except that, see, this this book predates all this bullshit about uh, uh, Tipu Jayanti and all that, much, much before that. Right, right, right. So my book was published in 2013, but uh, earlier I used to run a blog called Rediscovery of India. Mm. So there's this constant thing that, you know, uh, when the BJP government first came to power in Karnataka, one education minister here, he said that, you know, Tipu was a Desha Drohi and he was an anti Canada guy and made a, a comment and uh, Girish Karnat picked it up first. Mm. And he began blasting that education minister for saying the correct things, the truth mm. about Tipu. Mm -hmm. So then that went on, it became a huge, uh, you know, back and forth happened in all Kannada media largely here. I used to follow that. I also wrote a couple of pieces. Mm. And then I thought, you know, why not uh, do a full length book? Because this, this was something that, you know, debates of history and stuff like that. Mm. I thought it will be good if there is some kind of a documented record which exposes Tipu in a... A concise fashion, not like a thick fact academic book, but more like a popular narrative of history. So this was uh, uh, briefly the context for that. And so one thing led to the other and I wrote uh, uh, Tipu Sultan, The Tyrant of Mysore. So just to, the subtitle is just to uh, take away any illusions about uh, what Tipu really was. You know, so if... Just of it. Yeah. When I was a child, maybe like 10, 12, 13, something like that, I remember going to Tipu's palace in Sri Ranga Patna. Yeah. And I somehow had some things that, you know, he was also a worshipper of Ranganatha and all that. How true was that part? Look, there are a lot of these legends and uh, stories which might have a grain of truth to them. Hmm. For example, he was he also gifted uh, uh, some money or some jewelry or something to uh, Shri Kanteshwara Swami in Nanjan hmm. That's a very ancient uh, temple for Shiva. Hmm. Right, right, right. Nanjunda, nan, Nanju means poison. Hmm. So, Nanju Hunda. So, if somebody who has Nanju swallowed, Nanju. Yeah. he has not swallowed yeah. it, he has it in his throat. <laughs> he has it in his throat. So, blue throat. Right, right. right, right. So, so, that temple also he donated and he, he referred to him as Hakim Nanjunda. I so, see. Doctor, Doctor Nanjunda, because you know, some priests or somebody prayed when Tipu was ill. And he recovered from his fever and illness. So he made some donations. These are all common things. See, there are two things here, especially when you're talking about Muslim tyrants like Tipu. One thing is they are all very aware of their own human frailty. No matter what, if, if you fall seriously ill, even if you're a Sultan, even if you're a most ardent worshipper of Islam or whoever it is, you are aware of your mortality. When you're right. seriously ill and doctors tell you that there is no hope for recovery. Right. So you leave aside your, you know, Islam for temporary. Let me get back. Let me live for just one more minute. You know, healthy and wise and whatever. Let me stick on to be alive. So that does not take away from the fact that he, he was a destroyer of Hindu temples on an industrial scale. So you can, one swallow does not make a summer. Right. Right. Yeah. So on the one hand, you have thousands of temples that he's destroyed and then uh, people point out to his gift to the Sringeri temple and this uh, Sri Ranganatha temple and uh, uh, Sri Kanteshwara temple and say that, look, he's tolerant. He's not a big. It does not make sense at all. Mm -hmm. So now, that's um, what you know, the history says that very clearly. See, the thing is, the book came as a breath of, breath of fresh air because, uh, see, I've heard of this legend um, about mm. how some people, I think it is either Mandya or Melukote, one of the two, 
they don't celebrate diwali because he massacred so many fam, uh, family angers angers right so which which place is it melukote or uh, mandya melukote melukote right yeah so uh, i i have a very good good friend of mine uh, he is a melukote i don't know hmm. you you may know this story uh, his name is gopal melukote and hmm. his father was a freedom fighter he was a, a doctor a physician by profession and he used mm. to practice uh, medicine in mm. hyderabad mm. He, he was the king's medicine uh, 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 physician mm. now when india became independent there mm. was a freedom struggle in hyderabad also yeah. the people which was 85% population was hindu were saying mm. that we should merge with india and the nizam would have none of it and yeah, yeah. this doctor he stood mm. for in, uh, merging mm. with india and mm. and uh, this and and the king actually imprisoned him nizam mm. imprisoned him mm. but every time he had to do a, a health check up he would take him out of the jail he'll go on <laughs> so you see <laughs> <laughs> ultimately ultimately life is dear to everybody yes, <laughs> there yes. is yeah yes. very, very interesting stories uh, gopal is uh, 82 83 years old is a very good friend of mine we still share stories and oh, and, uh, and melkote was an mp of hyderabad for many years he was on mm-hmm. the cabinet of jawala nehru's government he was a very staunch congressman mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and uh, according to gopal melkote mm-hmm. uh, he he has told me about this story i just wanted to mm-hmm. uh, you know so these these are all things you know you pick it up on twitter and so on and so forth so right, what right. was the background why did he do that oh, who uh, yeah so People. he went on one of these destructive uh, uh, raids in poor mm-hmm. and uh, uh, malabar and all these places right so, every time he set out for uh, a raid or a conquest or whatever you want to call it he was returning i think uh, from his uh, conquest of poorg or in somewhere some portion of northern karnataka on his way he happened to pass by uh, melukote and he saw all these kafir celebrating deepavali and this massacre hmm for no other reason except that you know all these idol worshipers have to go see that that sounds very cruel but let me ask you a question was his army mostly muslim i mean how would hindus turn on hindus at that time well that is a sad part of it no it was not just uh, restricted to tipu sultan's army or hyderabad's army ever since uh, it begins from the time uh, islam actually gained a firm foothold in india hmm. so all these most of the soldiers in uh, in the sultan's army nawab's army more than half of them were uh, hindus like they were see you had a system of feudatories right and in some cases especially in a country like india where hindus were just way too numerically populous that they couldn't control you know convert everybody right so they made them feudatories and the feudatories everybody that whole system under them would be loyal to for example if you are a village headman you had to have a standing arm and you would report to your next boss who would be who would be in charge of say uh, 100 villages for example i see i see and his his boss would be a feudator then his boss would be a mahamandala vishwas and his boss would be the king of say some uh, 50 districts or say large substantial empire and he would in turn be a vassal or a feudatory of a sultan so these sultans quickly understood this system so when they wanted to set out on some kind of military campaign they would say you send your guys there and all right. these soldiers would be hindus so this is sad fact uh, of indian history that's all if you if you also i I've, i've read a lot of uh, tamil history also i mean mm-hmm. if you look at how the british uh, set foot on india mm-hmm. their first fort was formed in chennai in madras what what yes. what is today, modern day chennai yes. And, yeah. and 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 it all started first they yeah. said that mm-hmm. we want to do trading and mm-hmm. uh, so we want to build a place to store all our stuff mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. how they started it and yeah. uh, before they knew there was a fort that was built and exactly. then they said well now we have built a fort we need to fortify it so we need mm-hmm. to bring arms so suddenly yeah. you know this this place is completely close to everybody else and nobody oh, yeah. knew so, it, it, yeah what was happening inside yeah yeah and 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 see if you look at what you know how the muslim um, the moguls invaders got set foothold in india i have to guess mm-hmm. i mean i'm not 
uh, an expert or historian by any stretch of imagination, I have to guess that it was technology. Mm -hmm. These people were rode mm -hmm. on horses and Indian fighters mm -hmm. were mostly on elephants. The elephants can't turn around as quickly as horses did, I guess. Yeah, there's, there's no speed and all that. Right. But yeah, partly what you say is true. Uh, the tables were turned on India, especially in military technology with the use of gunpowder. I think mm. it was Babur who first got in gunpowder to India. Mm. And uh, see, wherever we have lost uh, throughout our history, Hindus especially, is uh, because of a lack of upgradation in our uh, war technology, military technology. And two, we waited, especially in the North Indian uh, thing, uh, Afghanistan, all, all that was part of India. Right. So during winter months, I call this the period between uh, Dasara and Sankranti. Correct. So it is extraordinary, extraordinarily cold in these mountain passes. Right. You know, Afghanistan, Northwest uh, of right. Frontier right. Province, what used right. to be called that. Right. So all these were, all these guys, especially the Muslim tribes, Turkish tribes, all these Arab tribes, they were accustomed to that harsh climatic conditions. They would regroup and they would come in a flash and our Hindu kings would be waiting in the plains, blissfully sleeping, unaware of this kind of preparation. Like these were determined and they had no rules of engagement on the battlefield. Whereas we had what is called as a Hindu code of war ethics about which I've written a three part series on Dharma Dispatch. So they had no such, uh, there were no rule, formal official rules of engagement. They would come, it would be a free for all war where no rules were followed. So we would give them about six months of time. So Dasara to Shankranti and uh, yeah, actually Dasara to Ugadi. So when the snows would melt and the sunlight right, would be right, seen right. in North India, right? The cold season. So you had six full months for these guys to prepare and come and invade. So they would be let down all the way until the plains, hmm. Indo-Gangetic plain, what is known as Indo-Gangetic plain. Right. So then when you come into the open battlefield, like the plain battlefield, then it would be a clash instead of preventing them, instead of getting intelligence and stopping them, preventing the attack, you know, nipping it in the bud, so to say, these guys repeatedly gave them time for this. So that is one major factor. And this happened not for two or three decades or whatever. It happened for nearly three centuries. So this is a big failing on the, as far as the military front is concerned, actual war. Then obviously he spoke about the technology. Even as recent as uh, Krishna Devaraya's period, for example, he would, on the one hand, conduct trade with the Portuguese, who were very powerful that time. And what would he give? He would give him, you know, riches, rubies, pearls, you know, precious stuff, spices. In return, he would get their horses. He would get their gunpowder, whatever missiles, whatever the equivalent. He would get them instead of building them indigenously, getting the technology here setting up a equivalent of R and D labs. Right, that right, 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 right. You see, you see that is still the case with Indian defense today. True. So how true, how true. You know, if you don't understand history, you're doomed to repeat it. And uh, let's hope that doesn't happen. Uh, today's uh, warfare is uh, also on multi dimensions yeah. too, right? Now I have yeah. one, one, one question on your thing. So you said Babur came with uh, gunpowder, but Mohammed yeah. Qasim was a good 900 years before him. That was he just came on boats, isn't it? I mean, along the ocean, yeah. Arabian Sea, he just no. came along the edge. Uh, yeah, yeah. So Makran was uh, now it is in Pakistan. Hmm. So first he set foot in Makran. Hmm. So it was a small port, but very strategic port. And again, it was the Raja of uh, Debal in those mm. days. Uh, before that, the same Raja, 60 years before uh, uh, Kasim came, he, would, he had successfully warded off all these guys. Uh, uh, mm. I think he was a caliph of uh, that period. I forget his name. Mm. Uh, Muaita, I think. I'm not sure. I don't mm. recall the caliph's name. They sent successively two, three expeditions. And uh, under Al-Hajjaj, who was a governor of Iraq at mm. uh, that time, and Iraq contributed uh, more than 60% of uh, the economy of the Caliph. Okay. So he pretty much had a free hand and he sent two or three expeditions, all of which were beaten back. And this was just, he sent them one, one, two expeditions were on the coast of Debal and Makran. Hmm. 
Hmm. All of them were decisively beaten back. And the third expedition was sent through the land route via Afghanistan. There, a few tribal jats, hmm. they bet a significant army. Now, we make movies, you know, super hit movies like 300. You remember that? You right, right, that. right, right, right. Yeah, right. so this, you have potential to make, you know, 50 web series just on this superb battle uh, of a few organized, unorganized band of uh, uh, jat tribes who gave such a shocking defeat to, they were vastly outnumbered, yet they managed to defeat and not only did, did they survive, that route was not taken by the Arab raiders uh, for the next 70, 80 years. Right, so right. this is all thrilling stuff actually. I mean in uh, uh, retrospect. When you study absolutely, absolutely. And then Kasim came again with a substantial you know, planning, organization, numbers, coordination and all that. And uh, this Raja of Dable, he still thought that, uh, you know, I'm sitting safely somewhere inside. We have already beaten back these guys. What can they do? So this lack diacetical, this negligent approach is forced us repeatedly. I don't know, one victory and you get all puffed up and now, oh, come on, nobody can beat us. <laughs> so this cost them dearly. Because he, he, allowed, he not only allowed them to take the coast of Makran, but he let them enter all the way 60 kilometers from his fort. Mm. Only then he realized, you know, that enemy is at the gate. It was too late. But... <laughs> well, also, you know, I've always wondered, and this, I heard this in a speech once, and I was always wondered this. The Khyber Pass at its narrowest is mm. 16 kilometers, 16 yes. kilometers, one six. Yeah, yeah. Now, I'm sure many Indians by that time would have heard of the 5,500 mile Great Wall of China. Mm -hmm. Why did India construct that 16 kilometer wall there? They could have made sure that at least that path was completely cut off. Yeah, well, I mean, I can only hazard a guess. I mean, uh, it's always nice to travel back in time and. Right, 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 right. Give an alternative conjecture of, uh, you know, what was a feeling. Uh, for the most part, see, we never went out. See, geography impacts history, right? right. So geography is, geography is also one of your defenses in warfare, in foreign policy, whatever you want. Right, right, you right. You use those right. words. But very common sense says that, you know, this is unconquerable. Nobody cared, basically. Right. See, this country, India, is singularly blessed by nature. Seasons come on time, <laughs> rains would come on time, you know, irrespective of all the famines historically that have happened, find their uh, disaster in terms of suffering human life might be enormous. But these famines for far and few in between, if you take the vast sweep of history in India. Right. So uh, coming back to your question on Khyber Pass, we never felt the need to go out because this land itself provided us with plenty. So you right. didn't even need to look outside. You look true. at the geography of China, go back in those days. It is large parts of China even today are uninhabitable. Correct, correct. Right, and what, what about Europe? It's a cold continent. Yes. So their first and basic struggle was with the forces of nature. <laughs> so you true, look at so the, true. For example, you look at maximum words in the English language. They are all some way or the other related to Navy uh, and the sea. Hmm. Navigation, whatever. Right? You take the maximum uh, uh, number of words, especially right. verbs. They all relate somehow to Navy. Right. You know, anchoring, mooring. Yes, yes. Right? So there's a connection between all this. What does it indicate? It indicates that land was uninhabitable. You had to, your daily... Uh, fight was with the forces of nature. So, if you had to go out, you couldn't grow anything there in that and live for a build a civilization, so to say. So, it took a long time for them to build actual cities and towns, and the way they could maintain them is to go out, invade other people, and get the spoils and use them for your own local economy. And, and uh, see, all this change, 
all this changed after the what you call scientific progress yeah so i mean the reason i brought up the wall is because see mohammed bin qasim was sort of like a blip in the sense that lalita ditya hmm. managed to preserve most of the upper sides he came just yeah, about he recon- 50, he recon- yeah he got everything yeah, he back yeah. Yeah. right so the next big invasion was ghazni mahmud of ghazni hmm. and that guy came through the khyber pass khyber pass and yeah. that was yeah. the one that ended up you know you know establishing the whole thing which is why i brought that hmm. and, and and see you contrast this with a shipwreck that was found in 5000 bce before common era mm. off of the coast of yeah. haifa okay yes. there yeah. they they have they found tin ingots 25 kilograms and about the size yeah. of 9 inches by 12 inches 25 kilograms heavy mm. this ingot mm, yeah. this was uh, this was dated to 5000 bce and it has mm. the same harappan symbols that you mm. can find in mohenjodaro and harappa you can find them in mm. dolavira and so on and so forth so the trading mm. was being done then and and yeah. the wreck was a catamaran where the coir yeah. was only available in kerala at that time yeah tin was not available where copper was available tin was available okay. off of the coast of airavathi yes yes airavathi yes. river is near mekong delta from there the yes. tin came mekong, yeah. the mm. co- copper was in gujarat and uh, rajasthan mm. and then somebody yeah. smelted all this created bronze yeah. and then yeah. he had his own hallmark certification yeah but really <laughs> this amazing stuff happened 5000 yeah. bce and mm. and and yet you know somehow when it came to you know uh, 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 protecting your border somewhere something mm. just went wrong anyway this was a fascinating discussion sandeep and i'm sure we can go on Indeed. Uh, oh, yeah. I, i don't know so, how much time you have but i would love mm. to ha- have you back again mm. for mm. for more discussions we don't have to have a set topic but today i think what we are talking about is history mm-hmm. where india mm. went wrong and and uh, i guess uh, we we'll, we'll have to see i mean india shouldn't go wrong again and i have a big fear about that because yeah, yeah. we are not prepared for a economic warfare by that i mean like if somebody uh, you know blockades you what happens cyber warfare yeah. india is not prepared very vulnerable yeah. systems and, yes. uh, and and i i know from experience yeah. being in the united states i see if you yeah. there are, there are yeah. websites that tell you where the attacks are coming yeah. every day you know people are trying to hack yeah, into yeah, systems yeah. Mm. 90% are from China mm. and North Korea 90% correct yeah there used to be this russian hacking the uh, ukrainian yeah. hacking gang about yes, uh, six, yes, seven yes, years yes, back yes 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 yeah. 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 most of them are now working as programmers which is why they are programmers <laughs> more gainfully employed <laughs> right gainfully employed so <laughs> yes yeah, so i think the hacking cyber warfare can be uh, cracked you know we don't it's not because of the lack of resources or patriotism or so whatever nice things it can be cracked very easily once you get the bureaucrats out of this uh, uh, management of all these critical assets get the bureaucrats out of it because they are totally good for nothing yes they are general specialists and they are yeah, nothing general, yeah. <laughs> they are general generalists <laughs> yeah. yeah so they keep their brains in the freezer once uh, they crack the is uh, thing right so, right 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 so, so i think that that's uh, one way so, we can do it. Yeah Sandeep it was a pleasure talking to you and Same we'll be time. having more Same. such fireside chats thank you very likewise, much likewise likewise my pleasure yeah thank thanks you.